Welcome everyone to the Universal Learning Series radio show, where we discover the spiritual and scientific universe. I'm your host, Sandy Andrew, on this day, Tuesday, June the 29th, 2010, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are broadcasting live from the United States of America. Our special guest tonight is Stanton Friedman, world-renowned author and public speaker. Stanton will be discussing his new book, Science Was Wrong, which is a fascinating collection of stories about the pioneers who created or thought up the impossible cures theories and inventions that the status quo said couldn't work. For example, two months before the Wright brothers' historic flight, a top scientist declared that no possible combination of known substances, known forces of machinery, and known forms of force can be united in a practical flying machine. Another example, germ theory was first advanced in the ancient Sanskrit text thousands of years ago, but wasn't widely accepted until late in the 19th century. Another example here is space travel was declared utter bilge in 1956 by the British astronomer Roy Al, who we will find out one of a long line of scientists who proved it was impossible. Throughout history, it has been difficult to promote the acceptance of new discoveries. How many have suffered or died because cures were not accepted? How many inventions have been quashed? How much scientific progress has been delayed or even denied You may be shocked to discover who said and did what. Stanton Friedman received his Bachelor of Science and Bachelor, excuse me, Master of Science degrees in Physics from the University of Chicago. He has lectured at more than 600 colleges, published more than 90 UFO papers, and has appeared on hundreds of radio and TV programs, including Larry King. Stanton has provided written testimony to congressional hearings and appeared twice at the United Nations. Please feel free to call into the show tonight at 646-200-3998 and visit the chat room here at Block Talk Radio to ask Stanton questions. And we would like to welcome author and world-renowned speaker, Stanton Reidman, to the Universal Learning Series radio show. I'm glad to be here. That's Stan Friedman, that is. Yes, sir. Thank you for correcting me there, Stanton. Uh, I said it wrong. (laughs) Okay. Um, Science was wrong. What made you write this book, Stanton? Well, let's remember that I only wrote half of it. My co-author was Kathleen Marden. We had done, uh, captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience back in uh, 2007. Uh, Kathleen was a social worker, a teacher, but she was also Betty Hill's niece. Mm -hmm. And because of my interest in UFOs, we've known each other for many years. And in focusing on the UFO scene, if you will, we found so many instances of people saying things that just weren't true, but because of their prestige, their situation in the world and so forth, uh, they got by with it, and they did a lot of damage. And uh, one of the stories in the book, for example, is about um, Ignaz Semmelweis, <clears throat> who figured out a way that would have resulted in the saving of uh, literally thousands of women's lives. He was uh, he delivered babies, and he ran a unit in Vienna at uh, hospital back in the 1840s and uh, discovered that, gee, the babies delivered by midwives, the women, the mothers, uh, only came down with childbed fever 2% of the time. Uh, the ones delivered by doctors, 
20% came down with childbed fever, which at that time was invariably fatal. Mm-hmm. And by be careful observing and watching what was going on, he finally figured that the doctors were going from doing autopsies upstairs to examining and sometimes delivering babies downstairs without washing their hands. The sign of a good doctor then was how bloody your apron was. And so he instituted careful measures, uh, strong soap and nail brushes and stuff like that, and even changing sheets uh, more than once a month, incidentally. (laughs) They didn't change them very often back then. And uh, he wrote papers. He figured out what was going on was that they were transmitting something from the cadavers, if you will, to the women, and you could stop that transmission by appropriate measures. Unfortunately, there were people at the hospital, especially his boss, who thought he was not being uh, appropriately attentive to the directions from on high, (laughs) to put it sort of politely, and he was forced out of the hospital. He wrote papers, did good science, did experiments with, showed that rabbits, the same thing happened if you weren't careful, etc. But, uh, and eventually they reinstituted, I mean, he was driven out of the hospital. A uh, hundred years later, there was a stamp issued in his honor. <laughs> it was, the germ theory wasn't accepted until the end of the 19th century. So during all those years, look at all the women that died because of the boss's big shot attitudes about we know best. That's one of many stories, but when you read these, you realize, hey, wait a minute, being stubborn and arrogant and ignorant is a terrible combination that gets in the way of progress. And with the whole business of flight, it wasn't just uh, Dr. Newcomb who made the comments that you quoted. I mean, he was an astronomer. What did he know about flight? Not a darn thing. And, but he had high degrees, he had a prominent position when he died, the President of the United States attended his funeral. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Wright brothers were just a couple of bicycle mechanics, except that they built a wind tunnel, they ran experiments, they confirmed theory with practice or the other way around, both ways. Uh, they knew what they were doing. He didn't know anything about that stuff. So there's a long history here. and. The consequences are not just, say, the women in the hospital, and that's bad enough, but uh, sometimes, well, a British um, aerodynamicist, I'll call him an aviation expert, Frank Whittle, developed a jet engine in 1930 and uh, was anxious to get it used for fighter aircraft, other aircraft. The thrust-to-weight ratio was much better than he expected it would be than with a propeller-driven engine, but... He was practically left out of town. He got no support. Six years later, a German, uh, Mr. von Ohain, came up with a slightly different design of a jet engine. And yet, despite that six-year lag, the Germans built the first jet-powered airplanes. Now, what would the history of the attacks on England have been if the Brits had had jet-powered planes then to defend them? And so these are the kinds of things that you worry about. Uh, There was resistance to the idea, just sticking with flight for a minute, Billy Mitchell was a pilot in the First World War, and he was speaking out a lot after the war, and he was talking about using airplanes to sink ships. The Secretary of the Navy said, I'd stand on any ship that guy was going to try to uh, sink. It never would be done. Well, time went on. And the epitome of consequences, if you will, uh, in, on November 29th, 1941, was the Army-Navy football game, which is a major event every year, big competition and all that sort of stuff. And the program for the game had a picture of the huge battleship, the USS Arizona. And there was a statement made, nobody has ever sunk a battleship from an airplane. Eight days later, on the attack on Pearl Harbor, the USS Arizona was sunk. 1,100 men died. Uh, that, that's what I mean about you know, consequences. You know, it's not just a casual argument, you know, who, who gets to buy the next round of drinks. We're <laughs> talking about serious implications. And 
uh, in more, on a more personal level, I, I wrote half the chapters, and Kathleen Martin wrote half. She wrote the one on eugenics, uh, this terrible movement that started in the early 1900s. You know, we know how to breed better plants. We know how to breed better cattle. Surely we can do better with people. Why don't we see if we can sort out and get the bottom 10% to be sterilized? This is condensing a long story into a short one. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out 